In this lecture, we're going to talk more about tidal theory um, with a touch on the dynamic theory of tides. Um, this theory um, was proposed by Pierre Simon Laplace in 1775. And it takes uh, the equilibrium theory, which has the relationships between the gravitational um, effect of the moon and the sun on the Earth's tides. Um, and it also takes in fluid motion. Um, so as you remember, so this, um, so we have those gravitational effects of the sun and the moon, and then it also ties in fluid motion. So as you recall, our tides are shallow water waves. Okay, um, they have wavelengths that are half the circumference of the Earth. Um, so these waves are always being affected by the Earth, uh, the Sun and the Moon, um, and the tides themselves experience a lot of friction with the seafloor. And they also collide with the boundaries of the continents. So it really helps us go from this hypothetical situation on our geoid and it takes into the reality that is our Earth and it's much more complex. Um, what we find out is that the tides interact with the boundaries of our continents, they interact with the seafloor, and ultimately the shape of the ocean basin and our basins do differ depending on where you are, um, but these shapes affect the tides. Um, and what we find out is that um, in our larger basins, so think about um, the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, the Indian Ocean, these really big basins, um, as the water is moving around, you can sort of think of it you know, these are really big waves. They're trying to move around this Earth because of the gravitational effect of the sun and the moon, but they are hit boundaries. And so they sort of slosh back and forth across these basins, much like a seiche wave um, in a closed basin. Um, so you can look at examples of seiche waves, um, or you can just think about sitting in a bathtub, um, and a seiche wave is like where you start sliding back and forth uh, in the bathtub, and you can get the water to kind of slosh back and forth. So it's high on one side and low on the other, and then the wave is gonna rock back and forth. Um, so that's kind of the seiche. Um, so quick, uh, think of it, that back and forth motion. So this dynamic theory explains the three tidal patterns that we see. Um, and I do go into detail in another lecture where you can look at each of those in detail, but these are our semi-diurnal, our diurnal, and our semi-diurnal mixed tides. Okay, uh, so basically this really helps us say, hey, we, you know, when we learn about this, we should get two highs, two lows of equal size per day. But what we find out is that uh, in reality, there are these three different patterns and we could get one of each depending on where we are. Um, so uh, this theory helps us explain it and it uses this idea of amphidromic circulation. So what in the world is that? So taking this idea of that seiche wave um, in a closed basin, an amphidromic amphidromic circulation explains the tides as waves moving around the ocean basins. So it's a rotating motion of the tides. Um, and it takes into account, so it's a rotating motion And Coriolis effect is going to play a role uh, in the creation of this movement. And basically you can think about it as the rotating motion or sloshing of the tides around these basins. So I'm gonna draw how an amphidromic uh, circulation system gets set up. Um, we're going to use this idea of an amphidromic point. 
Um, so I just write it as an AP. Um, this is a place or it's a, it's a node and it's in our oceans where there is no um, tidal change. And that's because the waves uh, count each other out. The crests and the troughs cancel each other out. Um, so to get one of these set up to really understand what's going on, we're going to look at it as like a four part system. And we're going to have our amphidromic point right here. And we're going to imagine we're sitting above the system that a wave is moving through this area. You can imagine that the whiteboard is kind of rolling or my arm is, is rolling underneath. So it would, if it could stick out, it would bulge up here in a long line. Now, as it's moving in this direction, Coriolis is going to be wanting it to go to the right. So we can draw Coriolis here. And what happens, our overall motion is that this wave, which is rolling in this direction, it's going to go to the right. Okay, now this is a closed basin. There's an edge right here. When the wave comes over to here, it's bouncing off and it's gonna come back towards this amphidromic point. So let's see, we'll kind of do that as step two is where it's bounced. Okay, so it's bounced and now it's coming back in this direction. Coriolis is moving it to the right and the ultimate direction of movement is off to the right. It's gonna hit the top of this part of the ba uh, basin. Okay. When it hits that top, it's going to again slosh back down. Coriolis is moving it to the right. We're in the Northern Hemisphere and our ultimate direction is over this way. We're gonna hit that Eastern edge, or excuse me, the Western edge of the basin And our motion is again back towards the amphidromic point, Coriolis deflects to the right, and overall our motion is now going to be directed back down towards the southern end. So if we combine all of these motions, and we can kind of go back into this direction, so it hits here, it goes this way, this way, this way. What we find out is we have now created a rotational motion of the tides that is counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere. In the southern hemisphere, it will go in the opposite direction. It's deflected to the left, so it'll be clockwise. So we now have this motion, and what we see happening is that the high tide is going to rotate around this amphidromic point, this node. Okay, um, so how can we visualize that? I will try to draw this one more way. So if we have our amphidromic point, okay, again, this is where we have no tide. Um, we want to imagine we're going to draw these lines kind of extending here. So this would be a high tide and it's moving in that direction. It's rotating around somewhere up here. We're going to have low tide somewhere here. We're going to have a high tide and maybe somewhere down here is our low. Okay, so there's a bulge. If we wanted to try to draw the, the high, um, I was trying to draw it sort of like this. So this is that high, and then here would be the wave coming around as a low, the trough, and then we're back up at the crest, and then the trough again. And this is rotating in that direction. So the tidal crest rotates around the point, and then there's two highs and two lows at a time. Okay, um, and then the amphidromic points has that no motion. Just remember in the northern hemisphere, it is counterclockwise. And in the southern hemisphere, it is going to be clockwise. Um, in the oceans, we see uh, 12 um, amphidromic points. So we have about 12 of these in all of the world's oceans. And I'm going to attempt to show you where those are. Um, please be kind in my drawing of the continental boundaries. So <laughs> we're gonna really quickly put this up here. Uh, I'm gonna try to draw. Let's 
this is South America. North America, we've got, okay, so this is North America, South America. All right, we're going to have, this is the Atlantic Ocean. There's the Mediterranean. This is Africa, Europe. All right, try to draw this. The other side of Africa. So Africa's again over here. We have Asia and Indonesia. Big important islands. Way out of scale. This is Australia. And then we have New Zealand down there. And I want to get Madagascar. Okay, so when we go and try to understand all of these amphidromic points, remember there are about 12 of them. Uh, we have one that's about here. These are all approximate locations. So they're spaced around. There's one down by um, Antarctica is down on the bottom. Let's see, we're gonna have one about here. There is one here. There's another one here. The um, Pacific Ocean has the most. It has about five of them there. We're gonna have one here and then one here. Okay, so, right, so we can see there are 12 amphidromic points. These are all their approximate locations in the oceans. Um, the Pacific Ocean has five of them. Um, and the reason is the Pacific Ocean is the largest of all the ocean basins. And because of its size, it's very complex. Um, so the amphidromic points, there are more of them there. Um, now we're going to go through and we're going to shade areas. Again, if you remember, these amphidromic points are places where we have the lowest tidal range, so zero tides. Um, I'm going to now shade in places that have the highest tidal ranges. I'm gonna do that with this purple pen. So we have some here, kind of between Africa and Madagascar. We have some up here, oh, up by the Aleutian Islands, up here through the Arctic. And right through there. So, and this kind of extends into there. So these places where we have the highest um, tidal ranges are generally found at the edges of the large ocean basins, okay? So these, um, you can, if you're trying to remember it, it's edges of large basins. Um, and they're often where we have bays and inlets. Um, basically kind of really interesting geometries that help concentrate the tides um, just because of their shape. So uh, over here, um, if we go west of um, Madagascar, that kind of stands out. We have bays up through here, behind the Aleutian Islands, um, up high in the Arctic um, in these areas. And then again, keep in mind that these are actually pretty far away from our amphidromic points. So we would have lower tides and the tides would get bigger as we move away from each of those amphidromic points. And that is my quick lesson on the dynamic theory of tide formation.